it never occurred to them that the Africans might have been using a form of mathematics that they hadn't even discovered yet. The Kingdom of Benin was magnificent. From the record-breaking walls of Benin to the actual city itself, it stood as one of the most influential kingdoms of its era in the world. Located in modern day Nigeria, this wonder has all but been forgotten. So let's change that. Firstly, I want to get into how advanced this city was, just purely in its design. So the layout of the city followed the rules of something called fractal design. Now, to keep it simple, this is essentially a geometric concept which arranges shapes in such a way that they can just keep going into infinity. Now, it is quite hard to describe, so hopefully this animation helps you to visualize just the basic principle. Anyway, the city of Benin and the surrounding villages obeyed these laws of symmetry, proportionality and repetition, such that everything was arranged in mathematically predictable patterns. And I mean everything, from every room within every house, to every house itself, to clusters of houses. It was all carefully thought out and precisely executed. Mathematician and author of the book African Fractals, Ron Eglash, claims that when Europeans first came to Africa, they considered the architecture very disorganized and thus primitive. It never occurred to them that the Africans might have been using a form of mathematics that they hadn't even discovered yet. At the very heart of the city, there was the King's Palace. Of course, if we're going for symmetry, then where else would the King's Palace be? Branching out from here, there were these massive arrow straight roads, each one up to 120 foot wide, which each carried with it an underground drainage system, which would clear away stormwater. Directly surrounding the King's Palace was an area of grassland, which would feed the livestock. And outside of this, we see the housing divided by much narrower streets. And of course the whole thing was bordered by a moat for extra security and remember that fractal pattern i was talking about so the whole city was divided into 11 sections with each one replicating the layout of the king's court with mathematical precision and this was the case for at least 400 years and also the art was something to behold it said that the wealth artistic beauty and magnificence of the city are what were most impressive to the first european visitors now just a quick side note if you watched my video on the lost city of atlanta then you might be seeing some similarities here. I will be going into more detail about the Western discovery of the Kingdom of Benin. But for now, let's just get into some facts about its walls just to show you how astonishing this city actually was. And if you're enjoying the content, don't be afraid to hit the subscribe button. It really does help me out. So the walls of Benin were built by the local Edo people and are technically known as earthworks, which is a series of banks and ditches used to fortify against enemy attacks. In total, the walls of Benin were about 10 thousand miles long. Most accounts record it as being four times longer than the Great Wall of China, so it could in theory be a record breaker for being the longest man-made structure ever built. But there is a lot of debate over this, especially since the advent of things like road networks, like for example the one which stretches from China all the way through Russia and into Europe. All of these are of course interconnected and that would therefore count as a single structure. But there is one record the walls of Benin did break. In 1974, they were featured in the Guinness Book of Records as being the longest earthworks in the world carried out prior to the mechanical era. With, as I said, the estimated length being around 10,000 miles and the estimated earth moved to create them around 150 million cubic meters. Now I know I'm bouncing between imperial and metric here, that's just kind of what we do in the UK, but I'm putting all the conversions on the screen just so that everyone understands what I'm talking about. This record is still live on the Guinness World Records website, by the way, and I'll put a link to it in the description. So anyway, 150 million cubic meters of earth move, the complete structure being 10,000 miles in length, and it's thought to have consumed 100 times more material than the Pyramid of Khufu, so it was far from an easy project. I just want to say that according to Fred Pierce from New Scientist, it would have taken 150 million hours of digging to construct this city. Now, as far as I can work out, 150 million hours equates to about 17,000 years nonstop. Now, that may well be a cumulative figure, like if you were to add up all of the hours that every individual put into it, because most estimates put the overall construction time at around 700 years, which is still a long time. Although I do also want to say that I have found some accounts that suggest this would have taken 5,000 people only around 100 days to build the entire city, assuming that they were having a 10 hour work day. So yeah, there's literally no consensus whatsoever, not even a vague ballpark figure. Now, because of this, it's very unclear when construction first began on the city. And all we can really say for sure is that it would probably have been somewhere in the first millennium. So literally between year one and year 1000. I found some estimates putting it around the mid 15th century, so around the 1400s, which would have been possible 
possible if we take that 100 day theory as true, but I'm not so sure about it, to be honest. And even if we take the 15th century as the rough time the construction was finished, we're really just relying on Western accounts for that information. Because conveniently enough, the Kingdom of Benin was first discovered by the Portuguese in that very same century, 1485 to be exact. They described the city within the walls as being illuminated by these huge metal lamps fueled with palm oil leading towards the king's palace. As I said earlier, the initial first impressions of the layout of the city were mainly confusion. It just didn't make any sense to them at first, but it was actually these early Portuguese explorers who gave it the name, the great city of Benin, calling it one of the most beautiful and best planned cities in the world. Now, obviously this sense of Western approval isn't something that Africa has ever needed or sought after, but it just goes to show how impressive this huge construction project actually was. Because at the time, there were very few places in Africa which were recognized as cities by the West. So they must have seen something particularly outstanding and clearly something that could rival, if not eclipse, their own European cities. In fact, in 1691, another Portuguese explorer, Lorenzo Pinto, had this to say, Great Benin, where the king resides, is larger than Lisbon. All the streets run straight and as far as the eye can see. The houses are large, especially that of the king, which is richly decorated and has fine columns. The city is wealthy and industrious. It's so well governed that theft is unknown and the people live in such security that they have no door to their houses. But this apparent utopia wasn't to last. Despite standing for over 400 years independently from the world, it didn't take long for the Europeans to bring about its demise. Initially, there was a decent trade relationship with Europe. Benin handed over its resources such as palm oil and ivory, and in return, they received guns. Of course they did. And as the transatlantic slave trade got underway in the 16th century, the Kingdom of Benin secured their relationship with Western forces by capturing neighboring people and selling them directly to the Europeans and Americans, presumably to protect their own people from the same fate. Now this actually provided much of the kingdom's wealth during this period, but the relationship was relatively short-lived. As word spread around Europe about this magnificent African city, it attracted more and more attention. Civil wars were weakening their position of power and they were less able to resist the inter interference of the British. In 1896, Vice Consul James Phillips ventured to Benin in the hopes of coming to a trade agreement, despite being warned by the Ober of Benin, the ruler, that he didn't wish to see the British at that particular time. Upon their arrival, Phillips and his men were ambushed, leaving very few survivors in what had become known as the Benin Massacre. In response, the commander of the British Royal Navy led what they called a punitive expedition, or an expedition intended as a punishment. 1,200 Royal Marines invaded the Kingdom of Benin from the east and the west. It has been described by historian Dan Hicks as involving massacres of towns and villages from the air and thus women and children across the whole Kingdom of Benin, scorching the earth with rockets, fire and mines. Primary among the war crimes was the scale of the killing and bombing of civilian targets. So there seems no doubt that the goal was to obliterate the entire kingdom and yet notice the difference in language. The actions of the people of Benin are described as a massacre and the retaliation which destroyed the entire city is described as a punitive expedition. It's just interesting. So that would obviously signal the end of the Kingdom of Benin and with the scramble for Africa well underway, the land on which the city once stood and the surrounding area of what is now modern day Nigeria was officially under British rule. Now earlier I mentioned the similarities that this kingdom had to the lost city of Atlantis, which may well have been another ancient African kingdom. If you're interested in learning more about that theory, then you're going to want to check out this video right here. I'll see you there.